Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics. My name is Heidi Matson, and I am a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board, the official student group of the Institute. The Student Advisory Board is a bipartisan group whose members can access many great opportunities through their involvement with the Institute, including volunteering at programs and networking with our special guests. If you are a student and would like to join, please contact us by emailing dolesab at ku.edu or speaking with a student worker after the program. A video of today's program will be available on our YouTube channel soon. You can also access today's, can access videos of past programs by visiting our YouTube channel at any time. A loop hearing system is available to use if you have a T-coil hearing aid. We also have li a limited number of listening devices. If you have questions about the loop system or at, if at any time during the program you have difficulty hearing, please alert one of our staff members. After the program, we will have some time for audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. Please stand if you are able and ask just one brief question. If you are a part of our virtual audience, you may submit your questions at dolequestions at ku.edu. The Dole Institute mis Institute's mission is to foster civil and respect discussion around important and often difficult topics. Please phrase your questions with this in mind. Before we be begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. Now please join me in welcoming Senior Associate Director, Dr. Bar Barbara Ballard. Thank you, Heidi. Good evening and thank you all for joining us at the Dole Institute of Politics. Before I introduce our guests this evening, I would just like to invite you to attend tomorrow's discussion group series uh, featuring Sheila Burke, uh, former chief of staff for Senator Bob Dole, as she sits down with our spring fellow, Bob Blamire, at 4 p.m. Uh, here at the Dole Institute of Politics. Several years ago, Sheila Burke was our guest as well in the evening. I hope you will all tune in virtually for the final program of the Presidential Lecture Series at 7 p.m. on March 24th as Richard Norton Smith, and I know you're all familiar, I think most of you with Richard Norton Smith, and he will be returning to present virtually The Legacy of World War II and Beyond, which is very appropriate if you think of what's going on at this time, especially with um, Russia and Ukraine. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our guests this evening. We are pleased to host jo John Roy Price, Special Assistant to President Nixon and Executive Secretary of the Council for Urban Affairs and the Council for Rural Affairs during the first Nixon administration. He will be interviewed this evening by Audrey Coleman, our Director of the Dole Institute of Politics. Tonight, John will discuss his memoir, The Last Liberal Republican, an insider's perspective on Nixon's surprising social policy. He places Nixon firmly in the liberal Republican tradition of President Theodore Roosevelt, New York Governor Thomas E. Dewey, and President Dwight Eisenhower. John, a member of the moderate wing of the Republican Party, and a co-founder of the Rip On Society is a retired president and CEO of the Federal Home Loan Bank of Pittsburgh. This program is presented in partnership with the University Press of Kansas, publishers of The Last Liberal Republican. Please plan to join us after the event for a book sale and signing in the back of this auditorium, I should say. We will leave time at the end of this program for questions and answers from our in-person, which is you, and the virtual audience. Remember, we're also live streaming as well on our YouTube channel. And you may, if you're an online viewer, submit questions to dolequestion at ku.edu. I'll repeat that because people sometimes say, what, what did they say? So I would say, 
It's dolequestions at ku.edu should you have a question that you would like us to introduce to our guests. And now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming John Roy Price. John, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Can everybody hear me okay? All right. I want to first ask you, by asking you, John, uh, a matter of timing. Uh, <laughs> why did you wait 50 years to write this book for the, su the surprising book in your words? I was busy with 40 years of being in the banking business after I left the White House in December of 1971. And uh, whatever propelled me to it, it's hard clearly to answer, but increasingly as I got close to the publication date, I realized that this book might have a lot of topical interest things like the child tax credit out in the, in the ether and such as that. But also I had kept diaries uh, from the time I was a young man and I had extensive diaries and I was also the official rapporteur or minute taker of the, the minutes that Richard Nixon chaired, uh, 23 of them in the first 18 months on urban affairs and I had just voluminous notes and, and official minutes and personal jottings and I, uh, also, the sands of time do run through the hourglass, <laughs> and it is 50 years later, and I still have my wits about me, more or less, you'll judge this evening. <laughs> and uh, so I just thought, get on with it. And then I was actually specifically triggered by being asked to do a lecture at Oxford University 11 years ago this spring. And that sort of got me going. It girded my loins for the effort, and, and I spent the next 10 years putting it together, visiting archives, uh, looking at uh, Hoover Institution, Library of Congress for people like Daniel Patrick Moynihan, John Ehrlichman, and George Schultz, and many others. Well, tell us a little bit about your background, how you first got into politics, and how did you come to work for, for President Nixon? Well, you know, uh, they have these security questions that you're asked on your frequent flyer accounts or things like that. You, what's your favorite musical instrument, cello? What, what, uh, what's your, what did you want to be when you were a boy, when you grew up? President. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, uh, I had this early instinct that I, I was interested in politics. And... I came of an age uh, being aware of World War II. I was born right after the Munich Agreement, 1938. And so to me, towering figures were Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill, Charles de Gaulle, and Joseph Stalin. And so this was, uh, this was what was in my head. And then I was uh, a, a Boy Scout. We used to make pilgrimages to Teddy Roosevelt's burial site. It was just about 15 miles from my house on the North Shore of Long Island, Sagamore Hill. And all these things sort of, and I saw Winston Churchill actually on uh, when he was in his second prime ministership uh, in about 1950 or so. I saw him driving up Park Avenue in Manhattan as I was still a, a early teenager. So all this together uh, stoked, it, it kept that fire going. Mm -hmm. So, and. Um, you know, how did you how did you obtain your position? I the well that and and then there were the details. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had been really interested, and in when I was a student at Grinnell College, we had a mock convention in 1960, and uh, Nelson Rockefeller had emerged. The governor of New York had been elected two years earlier, and he was uh, a lot of uh, you know a lot of excitement around him, and the Eisenhower administration was coming to a close and. Uh, so I, I got involved in the mock convention for Nelson Rockefeller. And then I went off overseas to England for a couple of years and came back to law school. And it, this is where it really, where the rubber hit the road. Uh, in law school, there was a group of us who felt like we were inchoate Republicans. We, you know, moderate, yeah, we, m meanwhile, Jack Kennedy had been elected. 42 years old, attractive, you know, charismatic, and appealing to young people. But we, we still felt we were sort of vaguely Republican, but we were, you know, as 22 and 24 year olds, vaguely embarrassed by Eisenhower in his, you know, in his last years. And, 
But there were a couple of them in this group who had studied in England and had learned about something called the bow group, B-O-W, like the bow and arrow. And it was a, a group within the British Tory or Conservative Party which uh, was designed to try to be a conveyor belt for policy generation, places like universities and institutes, to take that conveyor belt and take those ideas and get them in the hands and in the heads of office holders. And so that idea sort of sparked with some of us and we formed something which didn't have a name at first, but we, we met with this sort of vague sense that we were middle of the rotors and, and wanted to bring new ideas harnessed into public life. And then Kennedy was assassinated. And all of a sudden this thing gelled. And we took on the name of the place where the Republican Party had been formed in 1854 out in Ripon, Wisconsin, at a little white schoolhouse there. And we called ourselves the Ripon Society and emerged uh, as a, sort of, uh, you know, young group of people who wanted to do just as I said, bring ideas into, into politics. We were not Democrats, we were Republicans, but we were hoping to be like what Kennedy was energizing among young people. So that was the beginning. Then we came to the attention of a lot of the old wheel horses in the Eisenhower administration. Uh, John Hay Whitney, who had been his finance chair and was the owner of the New York Herald Tribune, which still was the vox populi for liberal Republicans and had been since Horace Greeley had, found, had taken it over from the Whigs in the mid-19th century and made it a Republican House organ. Um, so they began to like us and like what we did. and. and they began to get us out in front of the public with the power that they had on the megaphone in the press and their media connections. And so it all began to take fruit. And then I, uh, I wound up working for Nelson Rockefeller, who was the governor of New York. And uh, it was a time of the conservative upsurge. The Goldwater movement was in full throttle and, and full throat. And so I, was, I felt more comfortable on the moderate side and worked for Rockefeller and, and uh, then worked again for Rockefeller in 68. Mm -hmm. But then we can go on from there. <laughs> that so was very long-winded, I'm sorry, but, <laughs> but I hope it did lay the foundation. Well, for a good, for, you know, the beginning of your book, you give a very good explanation, a very thorough explanation of some of the uh, nuances, the different factions, different parts yes. of the Republican Party. Could you remind us what that sure. was going well, on Sure, well, the Republican the time? Party was, was founded out of factions. And it's never been without them, nor for that matter has the Democratic Party. But the Republican Party was, was the consequence of the breakup of the Whigs. The Whig Party finally just fell apart. And it also uh, drew in the know-nothings, which were sort of anti-immigration at the time, uh, though the Republican Party wasn't anti-immigration in its beginning. And it brought in the Free Soilers, leading to the Homestead Act and the Morrill Act, and, and uh, it, it brought in the abolitionists, crucially, the anti-slavery movement. So it was this disparate crowd of factions, and it managed to wind up uh, winning the election of 1860 in a four-way, um, and then moved forward and went back and forth in pendulum swings between what you might call regular Republicans, and, and more progressive or, or activist. I think activist makes more sense than to call them progressive or liberal or whatever. Um, and so in more, mod more modern times, Teddy Roosevelt, of course, is vivid in people's memory as an activist. And uh, the regulars at the time put him in the safe spot of being vice president, sort of park him off on a siding somewhere. And the Karl Rove of his day, Mark Hanna, was very concerned about Roosevelt being elevated to the vice presidency. And he said, that cowboy is dangerous. And so he proved to be, from the point of view of stand pat, more cautious people who did not want the federal government inspecting foods or drugs or breaking up trusts and monopolies. So he was, he was a sort of rambunctious figure. And then do either the petulance or or conviction that he was the best thing for the country. He basically broke up the party in 1912 and uh, led off into the world. 
And then Hoover is a fascinating figure, uh, Herbert Hoover, Herbert Clark Hoover, an Iowa-born Quaker, been to his hometown in West Branch, Iowa, near where I went to college at Grinnell. And Hoover started out as a, uh, an engineer. He went to Stanford and among the first crop of engineering students met his wife there who was the same, Lou Hoover. And Hoover, because of his work at the end of World War I, became a worldwide known figure, a, a figure of importance, of generosity, and he had led relief efforts for a starving Europe at the end of World War I. They were fabulously successful. Belgian relief, uh, of course, the, to the British, even the Russians. He took food in to both sides in the Russian Civil War, red and white armies. And uh, for that, he, he, he achieved enormous recognition. He came back and was regarded as the great social engineer. He was regarded as an activist, liberal figure. Almost sought the Democratic nomination in 1920 and then uh, wound up uh, serving in the, in the cabinet of Cal Coolidge. And Hoover's, Hoover's situation caused dyspepsia to the regulars within the Republican Party. Andrew Mellon, who was Secretary of the Treasury and a Pittsburgher, uh, wrote in his diary that Hoover was dangerous, that he was an activist. And indeed, that was his basic, uh, basic MO. But then uh, came his election to be president and the presidency and the Great Crash, the Depression. And uh, he fought quite actively to try to turn that around, but it wasn't enough. And then when he went out, beaten by Roosevelt, Hoover became very anti-New Deal, very, very anti pro, you know, what government was doing. And he, he became more and more embedded in that point of view. And so he became the icon for the conservatives, for the resistance, if you will, to the New Deal. All that's going along, and then voila, 1936, someone named Alf Landon a progressive governor of Kansas. He was a moderate. And he had had a, an unusual, singular success in 1934 in getting reelected. And were elected for the, in the first place. And he, he wound up being the candidate in 1936. And it's my, my premise that starting with Alf Landon and running through Wendell Wilkie, in 1940, and two Tom Dewey nominations, and then Ike for two terms, and Nixon in 1960 being nominated, that you had what I call the presidential wing of the Republican Party in the mid-century, from Landon through Nixon's uh, unsuccessful 60 campaign, and that they were more activists. They were in counterpoint to the congressional Republicans, led by Bob Taft of Ohio, who had worked with Hoover on relief and who found no sympathy in him for the Europeans at all and basically became disinterested in the plight of Europe then and in the future, which led to his timidity about the Second World War. He gave a speech in Kansas City, Bob Taft did, after Dunkirk, after the evacuation of two or 300,000 British and remaining Belgian and French from Dunkirk, in which he said, well, in effect, I'm paraphrasing, but in which he said, well, let's just, you know, let it be, and if Germany wins, that's all right. So uh, you had that wing of the party. It was, it was isolationist, but it was also more, more sort of wanting to conserve, uh, you know, power closest to home, and that was the rhetoric and, and the value of, of the conservatives. And Eisenhower... Uh, would not have run for president if Bob Taft had told him that he, Bob Taft, would support the creation of NATO. Taft said, I can't do that on philosophical grounds. And Eisenhower at that moment made up his mind that he would be inclined to go for the presidency in order to carry the internationalist flag. So anyway, that's a long answer, but then it leads you up to Richard Nixon. So who is Nixon? Nixon is a... a very interesting young congressman from California, came in the same crop as Jack Kennedy and as Jacob Javits from the Upper West Side of Manhattan, a liberal Republican who went on to a great career in the United States Senate and others. 
And uh, the attitude, I think, as I go back and look at it, of these folks was uh, that they had just come back from fighting a world war and they were not about to go to war against the New Deal. I think that's a bottom line uh, assessment of the attitude of many, many of the returning veterans. They, they saw that a social safety net had been in large part put in place where there had been none. You, just think, the Depression hit when there was no social security, there was no unemployment insurance, there was no medical insurance of any kind, and there was nothing except charity and relief. And uh, Nixon's mother, a Quaker, would open the door of the kitchen and have people come in and feed them at her table. They were starving. And Nixon, as did a Bob Dole, and as did that generation, grew up thinking that one had to be self-reliant. The Dole, the, you know, the idea of welfare or payments to people for, one might say, doing nothing, was wrong or abhorrent. And yet there was always, in polling, and if you ask someone individually, there was always, always a willingness on the part of a, the vast majority of Americans to say, you know, people who really need help and really deserve help should have it. There should be no problem with that. So uh, there, there was this feeling that, that the New Deal had put something in place which was really important. And Nixon and others felt that there were other parts of it which were ludicrous and far overreaching and out of line. And so there was always this struggle between do we beat up the bureaucrats or do we really address people's needs and how do we do that? <laughs> tell Another us long answer, I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> no, that's wonderful. Um, tell us about, uh, so you mentioned you worked for Nelson Rockefeller in 1968 in his campaign. I did. Tell us about the 1968 campaign, your experience uh, campaigning sure. against Nixon and what was his, sure. his message and, and the messages that were shared sure. then. Well, d don't forget there had been the Goldwater election in 64. <clears throat> and I was at that convention working for Nelson Rockefeller. Henry Kissinger was there working for Nelson Rockefeller. <coughs> and uh, that was quite something because the majority of Republicans, when polled, indicated they did not want Barry Goldwater to be the nominee. But the conservative movement had come out from under the shadows of the Eisenhower administration. They had rebelled against it. Uh, the Eisenhower administration, in its uh, congenial manner and sort of centrist politics, had managed to to suppress the conservative movement for a long time. But as the administration ended in Eisenhower's uh, last couple of years, the, the conservative uh, organization strengthened and its resolve strengthened. And so they began building from the grassroots up. And that's what happened in 64. Uh, the conservatives had moved extremely effectively at, at the local level in capturing YR, young Republican organizations, or state committees, things like that. And so when we got to 64, to the convention in San Francisco, I was coming with John Hay Whitney out of the elevator, who, who was a patron of the Ripon Society and, and a, a ultimately of mine in a way. And we stepped out of the elevator, and he'd been Eisenhower's finance chair twice, 52 and 56, and had known everybody in the party. And he stepped out of the elevator and said, John, I don't know anyone at this convention. You know, there'd, there'd been a complete turnover of the delegations uh, to the conservatives. And then, don't forget the Republican Party in 1964 was still largely a northern party. Not just a northeast, but a northern party. Maybe Iowa, maybe Kansas, Michigan, Nebraska, and so on. But what happened was there was a total wipeout of the Republicans in 64. And so coming off of that and trying to lick their wounds, the Republicans got a, a pragmatist, and they put him into the Republican National Committee, Ray Bliss of Ohio. And he was asked to rebuild the party and try and have it be non-ideological and let's, let's leave this carnage behind us. So that was 64. 66, things looked pretty good. There were a lot of Republican victories. The United States Senate, Mark Hatfield, Chuck Percy, governorships, uh, mayoralties in between, John Lindsay in New York, uh, Arlen Specter in Philadelphia. And 
uh, so there was a momentum toward uh, a potential Republican recapture, plus the Vietnam War, plus the social disturbances and the changing in sexual mores and all kinds of things that were genuinely and legitimately bothering people. They were unsettled, they were disorienting. So the Republicans had, had a real shot. And Nelson Rockefeller was a great schmoozer. He was a man who really believed in ideas, but he, uh, he didn't seem ever to understand that the path to the presidency lies not in position papers, but through a thousand chicken dinners, such as the wonderful one we had tonight. <laughs> and uh, so Rockefeller, firsthand, I, I had worked for him in 63. I did the original opposition research on, on a guy named Barry Goldwater for Nelson Rockefeller. And then uh, the National Committee man asked me to lead an effort in southern New Hampshire to, in, for 64 to help out Rockefeller getting delegates for the convention. And I, I, I hit a, a brick wall because he had tried it four years earlier and then he'd gone in, you know, he just sort of ducked out because Nixon was going to win the nomination. And so people felt they'd been betrayed and he'd hardly written a thank you note to people who'd stuck their heads out for him in New Hampshire. So I made no progress. And then four years later, uh, I did work for the campaign, which was a slapdash last minute affair. And he started in and then in a coy manner, he pulled out. And he said that the Republican Party should seek and and draft someone, and then he basically described Nelson Rockefeller, <laughs> you know, uh, but that didn't work. And so we had an uphill battle. I ran a group called the Delegate Intelligence Unit for Nelson Rockefeller. So we built folders on all the delegates, 1,333 and the alternates, same number, and we tried to figure out what their interests were, you know, were they Kiwanians, were they, did they bank at a, and of correspondent bank of the Chase Manhattan, a sort of somewhat Rockefeller identified bank. Uh, were they interested in national security stuff? We got, I got Henry Kissinger to go talking to Senator Jack Miller in Iowa about national security. We were trying our best to, to uh, win it. But Rockefeller had the misguided notion, in my view, that he and Ronald Reagan could mount a pincer movement, a successful pincer movement on Richard Nixon, hold him off on the first ballot, and then Nelson thought he'd win the nomination. Well, <laughs> not with Ronald Reagan in the picture, you know, not if you've stopped Richard Nixon. And so that was a flawed theory from the beginning. Plus, just intra-campaign, within the campaign itself, what I found was that um, it was totally disorganized. Nixon had learned his lesson from 1960 when he tried to run it all by himself, and he put a guy named John Mitchell in total charge of the campaign. Uh, Rockefeller had four main avenues of approach to him. He had a guy named Emmett Hughes, who was a speechwriter and journalist who'd been, I think, with Time magazine. You had uh, Bill Ronan, who was his chief admin guy. You had George Hinman, who was his national committee man and basically political guy. And then you had a Henry Kissinger. And if you got a no, if you went up that one ladder and got a no, you just start up right up the next ladder and try and approach him from another angle. So it was, it was mismanaged. And, and uh, Rockefeller, he, he almost, he and Reagan almost held, them all, held Nixon off, but he, he just didn't manage to do it. And he called Nixon. He called Nixon the morning after the nomination. This is in Nixon's memoir. And, and uh, he congratulated uh, Richard Nixon on, on the nomination. And Nixon says, I, I then expressed my condolences to, to Nelson that <clears throat> he hadn't won the nomination. And Nelson said, yeah, he said, Ronnie just didn't deliver, meaning Ronald Reagan just didn't chip off enough votes to hold Nixon off on the first ballot. Mm -hmm. Well, before we get into some of the surprising social policy, is there <laughs> yeah, any... We, we've been on a long detour <laughs> here, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, is there any uh, indication in 1968 in Nixon's campaign that he is about to do what, what he ends up doing as far as domestic policy? I met with Nixon three days before he went up to New Hampshire to declare for the 1968 nomination. I met about 
January 26th, 7th, 8th with him at a small dinner in New York. There were about seven or eight of us. And I, at that point, said, you know, you should look at welfare and you should look specifically at an idea called a negative income tax. Because I said there's an amazing convergence on this concept between conservatives and liberals. And it could be a potential solution to what's happening in welfare. And Nixon said at the time, he said, I, I, welfare is absolutely something that has to be addressed in the campaign. Uh, but he said, I'm not ready to go there yet on a specific. But I, I had told him, I said, Barry Goldwater's economics advisor in his campaign in 64 was Milton Friedman, the Chicago School economist. And he had written a book two years earlier called Capitalism and Freedom, in which he posited this negative income tax idea, meaning an income-tested program of cash assistance to families, where the cash payment from the government reduced as the earned income, if any, of the family increased. It's like the child tax credit, which is the echo today of Nixon's idea. And then on the, on the Democratic side, you had uh, you know a lot of Council of Economic Advisors types from Kennedy and Johnson talking about it. And then the Ripon Society, I, I was the first paid employee of Ripon while I was still in law school. I worked 20 hours a week for Ripon as research director when I was finishing law school. And we had come up with a research paper on the negative income tax. So I've, he, he heard about that. He said, look, welfare, he didn't say this, but welfare then was not unlike immigration now. It was a real hot issue because the welfare rolls had just increased exponentially, especially in northern big cities. And people just didn't know what to do about it. It became uh, a racist issue and it became a, a geographic uh, issue and certainly um, deeply political. People were really worried about it. So he knew he had to do something about it. But uh, there was not yet an intimation of the specifics. So after Nixon is elected, how did yes. you find yourself in the White well, House? Well, what happened that? was even before uh, he got elected, uh, I went off and licked my wounds after we, we Rockefeller, lost the, the convention. And then I, I got asked to come and work for Nixon in the general election. He was a broad church Republican, broad church man generally, broad tent. And so he reached out and a couple of his top people said he'd like you to work for him. And I was unsure. And I'd been working, I left law practice and I went to a community development corporation which had been started by bipartisan, by Jacob Javits, my United States Senator, Republican, and Robert F. Kennedy, Bob Kennedy, Democrat, in Bedford-Stuyvesant. So I, went, I left law practice and I went to Bed-Stuy. And then I took leave to work on the Rockefeller campaign. And, and then the Nixon emissaries come and say, would you work for us? And I, I didn't know, I was really uncertain because of uh, I'd worked for the other guy and I just had my, as the Scots say, I hey me doots, you know, I've had my doubts about Richard Nixon. And so I went to my boss at Bedford Stuyvesant and I, we went to, to breakfast at a place called Junior's on Flatbush Avenue, famous for cheesecake. And we had breakfast together and I, I said to my boss, I, I just don't know, I've been asked, I don't know. And he was a Republican from New Richmond, Wisconsin, who had been a plaintiff's lawyer. Then went down when Eisenhower created the, the Civil Rights Division within the Justice Department. And he worked as in the Civil Rights Division. And then he was made Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights as a holdover by Bob Kennedy. Then he came to be my boss up at Bed-Stuy. And I said, I don't know. He said, John, you're a Republican, aren't you? I said, I'm a Republican. And uh, he said, well, look at the other side said, you've got Dick Daly, big city boss. You've got Dave Dubinsky, Dave Dubinsky, huge labor. And you've got John Connolly, Southern Democrat. He said, don't be squeamish about it. He said, of course you work for Richard Nixon. That boss was John Doerr, who about four years later led the team of lawyers for the House Judiciary Committee to impeach Richard Nixon. But he's the one who convinced me to go to work for Dick Nixon. And so I worked during the general election for Nixon. Mm -hmm. Then I 
was asked by Pat Moynihan to join him on my 30th birthday as his counsel and uh, basically the rapporteur for, the, for this domestic cabinet that Nixon chaired. Pat Moynihan, a Democrat, prominent yes. Democrat at the time. Prominent. Yeah. And uh, had Pat Moynihan, I'd worked for Nelson Rockefeller, but Pat Moynihan had worked for Bob Kennedy and then Hubert Humphrey against uh, Richard Nixon. But what what attracted, uh, you and I talked, I think, a little bit mm -hmm. about uh, a bit about, about this. And uh, what happened was that Moynihan, a couple of years earlier, had given a speech to the Americans for Democratic Action, which is sort of the wheelhouse of of the liberal democratic uh, uh, group was at the time. And Moynihan urgently said, liberals and conservatives have got to get together, have to come together to combat the extremes in both polar pieces of their parties. Otherwise, we're headed for a national tragedy. And Nixon was given that uh, speech by Moynihan's and said, I want to talk to this guy. And Moynihan, in addition, was the head of the Joint Center for Urban Studies at Harvard MIT. So, with all the the uh, race riots and distress going on in the in the country and urban uh, poverty, uh, you know, Nixon wanted to talk to somebody who, who at least in a nominal way, had some understanding of that as well. So it was, it was this combination of the stability of the society uh, with the problems of the cities, which were just just tough. There were almost a hundred, over a hundred riots in the 18 months leading up to his inaugural. Everywhere, you know, Lincoln, Detroit, you name it. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the ways that President Nixon worked with Democrats or maybe would surprise us with social policy? He started out with an internal effort, uh, really, and uh, he felt convinced that the Democrats would go along with his welfare reform. He just felt there was no, no other way for them to go. It was sound reasoning. It was sound policy. So what he did was he, after a huge internal debate uh, between conservatives and more moderates, uh, and he, he watched it blow by blow. I mean, he read ring binders of memos and, and so on, and he finally, finally embraced the idea of this negative income tax. And he sent it up. Uh, in August of 1969, and he lamented that he had only three members of his cabinet with him. The rest were not on board. This was like uh, a little bit like Lincoln saying, you know, seven against and I vote yes, the ayes have it, you know. And um, he, Nixon was, uh, he said, this is, this is a, a gamble on human nature. He wasn't absolutely convinced it would work, but he said the current system is not working. And this, this got him where he lived because this was getting away from, as I said, from the categorical assistance programs of AFDC and got him to the issue of poverty and instead of services, providing money or cash for poverty. And it meant looking at where poverty was. And where was it? almost equally among whites and blacks in the South, in the old Confederacy, because their welfare programs, if you had them in counties, were paying below their own stated subsistence level. So it was, it was partly a, an absolute abdication of responsibility by state and local governments among the more southern states. But it was also just the, the absolute raw data that the poverty of People, you know, working full time, whether it was a female-headed family or a, f a male-headed family, they were working full time and they were still below the poverty line. So that's what family assistance plan was directed to. They tried to have a hold harmless, so a state like New York couldn't cut back its assistance levels, but it became a completely it was to become an absolutely federalized program, and was to have a stated minimum floor of income for a family, and. It was something he became convinced would just had to be put out there. And he did it, and what happened was uh, basically the liberals, for the most part, couldn't get on board because it was Richard Nixon. And there was just too long a history of, of uh, you know, animus toward him and distrust of him and mutual. It was, it was healthily reciprocated, you know. Uh, but 
there was that, and then the conservatives, and he he rightly was concerned about about the conservatives and their view toward this, and that's a whole story, which is on in a way almost the hinge of the book. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit about Nixon's perspective on health care policy. That's interesting because unlike welfare, where he came late to the game, you know, he wasn't any kind of any kind of specialist or particularly informed in in uh, you know, welfare or social assistance. Healthcare was a different matter. And I, I find healthcare to be the best way to look at Richard Nixon and, and who he was and how he was about government. Because uh, part of his family story is that there were two of his brothers, two of his four brothers, who, different times, contracted tuberculosis. And it was a desperate disease in those days. And they had no health insurance. Who did? And so his mother had to leave with one son at a time for Arizona for a a TB sanatorium and nursed her son, but also in order to pay for that, nursed other other people, young and old, who were there. He died. The son died. And then a few years later, she did the same thing with a second son who died. So Nixon started with an, a sort of ache in him about the inability of the family to have managed that crisis of catastrophic cost. And here we come back to Jack Javits, Jacob Javits. And we come back to Bob Taft. Because when Nixon came in in 46, two years later he's reelected unopposed. He ran unopposed in 48 and got reelected. So then that same year, Harry Truman gets elected in his own right. And Truman is carrying the torch for completion of the New Deal safety net. And Truman goes for a single payer uh, program for health insurance and health care, just like it up to today among the single payer advocates. Nixon. Well, and and then Taft and the conservative legislators on the Hill took a different tack with a little resonance today. They said, no, no, no single payer, no government run, no government finance thing. What we need to do is we need to have a modest block grant program (coughs) where the federal government just gives some money to some states and, and they're to do with it as they wish about providing medical insurance or coverage for their citizens more or less, or not at all. And so Nixon and Javits said, no. And they were joined by two liberal Republican senators, Winston Prouty of Vermont and Irving Ives of New York. The four of them, in 1949, sponsored a bill which called for a universal health insurance program using the private sector and with an employer mandate to cover your employees. And it didn't pass, neither did uh, Truman's, neither did Taft's version. So fast forward to 1971, and Ehrlichman, John Ehrlichman, the the fellow who'd taken over domestic policy, um, goes along with my request to to help on the health, health effort. And what Nixon did in 71 was to basically take a lot of the concept that he and Javits had used in 1949 and they, we came up with a proposal which was for universal coverage. It had an amazing array of benefits, you know, full uh, hospitalization, outpatient care, extended care, catastrophic uh, situations, pediatric care, dental, vision, and prescriptions for all, not just Medicare too, you know, for, for seniors. And uh, he sent that up. And that was, uh, he was driven still by memories of his brothers, and he was uh, in a a much more comfortable and familiar place when he was thinking about health care than when he was looking at welfare reform. And then um, the the story goes on because it didn't make it the first time, and uh, it called for employers of one or more employees to provide insurance for their their uh, employees. It also, 40 years before the Affordable Care Act, Richard Nixon asked for coverage of pre-existing conditions. 40 years before Obamacare. 
Anyway, it didn't happen. But then fast forward, 73, 74. Nixon's tottering on the brink with Watergate. But he tries again on health care. And this time, he starts teaming up with a man named Edward Kennedy, Democratic senator from Massachusetts. And a friend of mine was representing us. Was, I, I was gone. I was back in New York in my business. Uh, but a friend of mine was uh, representing the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. And uh, Stan Jones, who was Ted Kennedy's uh, chief legislative guy, was representing Kennedy. They met secretly for weeks in the basement of an Episcopal church on Capitol Hill and hammered out a potential compromise. Ted Kennedy went back to his people, which was basically the Committee of 100, a largely labor-dominated, organized labor-dominated group, and they just said, oh, you've given up too much. You know, you're allowing co-pays and deductibles, which are, you know, hard for, for working folks to, to sustain. And Nixon was beginning to get flack about, again, things like, you know, free prescription drugs and, and coverage of pre-existing conditions and universal coverage. And so at the last minute, it failed. And the story was that, that Ted Kennedy had said until he died that the worst mistake he'd made in his career was not to make that happen, not to work with Nixon and get it across the goal line. And I thought that was an urban legend. And so I, I was at lunch four, five, how many years ago? 2016, with Senator Christopher Dodd of, of uh, Connecticut, United States Democrat senator. And I said, he, I was talking about my book, which was still gestating. And I said, let me ask you something. I've heard that Ted Kennedy had expressed that sentiment. Is that true? And Chris Dodd told me, he said, John, he said, Ted Kennedy told me not once, but maybe five or six times that it was the worst mistake he'd made in his life, not to make it happen with Dick Nixon. So... Thank you. I have one more question, and then we'll open it up to the questions from the floor or from our virtual audience. Uh, John, so we could talk more about the social policies of Richard Nixon, yes. but we don't want to give away everything. We wanted to <laughs> buy your book. But what would you say, um, you know, if in, in your experience from what your work with him and the, and the policies that you all developed in the early 1970s, if, what would the country look like today in terms be, of I think it would be vastly different because there's such a sense of economic insecurity and and you look at those not covered by any health insurance and you think about how how they feel about their kids and you know I, I can't take my kid to a doctor I can't afford it and uh, and for themselves too I think just a sense of a certain basic you know sense of security and and I think that the the uh, child tax credit type thing were it in place. We saw that in that one year, last year, that it was in effect, that it, it abolished virtually 60, 70 percent of child poverty. And that might be a little bit of worry to some parent, you know, about not having enough money to feed your family with. So I think that that it would have made a huge difference. And food stamps feed tens of millions of people today. And it was Richard Nixon and Bob Dole and a handful of others who, who created the food stamp program. Mm -hmm. And it's a negative income tax. It's, it was the first negative income tax in effect. It's an income-tested, guaranteed income in kind, not cash, to families across the country. And uh, so it, it would have had a major stabilizing and psychologically lifting effect. It would not have it would not have cured everything. It's no panacea, but I think it would have disabled the ability of, of people to prey on these anxieties in quite the way they have. Thank you. All right, if any of you have questions in the audience here, we have a student who can come uh, bring a microphone to you, raise your hand, and they will come to you, and you can ask a brief question. Don't be shy. Here in the front. That was just incredibly rich. Thank you so much for that. And uh, for a guy who supposedly knows some of this, that was eye-opening. Thank you. I'm a historian on the subject. <laughs> so I'll ask you a little bit of an insider a question. A serious judge. <laughs> that's content. No, that's, 
So some people say that Nixon got most interested in the idea of Moynihan's plan to create support across the board for poor Americans because he also saw it as a way to basically cut at the legs, the bureaucrats, the city officials, all those people who sponsored, administered, and took care of those programs. And that that just hit his funny bone. He thought that would be hilarious to basically cut all well, those people out yeah. of their work. And that the, the story I always had was that he didn't care that much about the program. You're suggesting, though, that he was oh, he serious. Did. Oh, he, he did. cared. Yeah. It wasn't just something that he yeah, and, and listened to and then gave up on fairly easily. Yeah, I mean, part of what you're saying is, is true that there was, you know, Nixon, despite he was the fact he was a man of government, as Pat Buchanan concedes to me, uh, to his great, great frustration, often Buchanan, but, but Nixon did have an anti-bureaucratic, uh, you know, uh, gut as well. Partly because, as I said before, you know, it was sort of meet and raise. Uh, they, they would, uh, you know, give each other a hard time. And he was, Nixon was convinced that most of the Democrats were, were, uh, would be delighted if he fell and stumbled and, and didn't win re-election. But I think the, the charge that he was not interested in the program is nonsense. And I say that on Christmas Eve of 1969, December 24th, I was sitting there in the Oval Office and a man named Jean Mayer was there with me. Jean Mayer was a fascinating guy who had just led the White House Conference on Food, Nutrition, and Health. And he was uh, from uh, Harvard Medical School and went on to be president of Tufts University. Interesting guy. He'd been a guerrilla with the French against the Nazis. He'd been captured by the SS, escaped by killing an SS guard and getting out. He was recaptured and managed to escape uh, breaking a leg and limping ever after, and then went to join the, the uh, Free French in Africa, and then later was a uh, partisan in metropolitan France. So he was not a timid kind of fellow. <laughs> and uh, he was all for uh, things like the food stamp program, but that was a part of the report which he had fashioned out of this rambunctious White House conference. It had 1,700 delegates or something and was, and was not all Nixon fans. <laughs> and so uh, the point was that he brought in this stack of papers and it was being handed over to me for implementation. I was the guy tagged with uh, making the results uh, real. So we were sitting there, the three of us, and Nixon behind his desk. And, and um, he said, you know, John, we, we sort of slid the books to me and then started talking about family assistance. And he said, you know, uh, we need to get it and we will get it. And he said, here's, here's the rub. He said, every year uh, the Democrats will vote to raise the floor, meaning the level of support. And he said, every year the Republicans will vote against it and every year the Republicans will lose. He said, it doesn't matter because we will have established the principle." And that went on with a number of different things that he said. And, and also, uh, in the autumn of 73, um, there was another effort over at HEW to rekindle that thing uh, with, under Casper Weinberger. And the deputy was a good friend of mine, Frank Carlucci. And he showed me a paper that there was only four people had seen it about a revived family assistance plan. And he said, Cap's going to take this to the president. Uh, and then I happened to be in London for a meeting, and I was asked to go to a cocktail party. And among the more illustrious people there were Lauren Bacall and Gregory Peck. But I was drawn to United States Senator Eugene McCarthy, who was also there. And I went over to him, and I berated him because he had not supported the Nixon plan in the Senate Finance Committee, where he was a key liberal Democratic member. And he said, oh, well, he said, you know, it, it wasn't big enough floor, and that was one of the issues. The, the welfare rights organization was always campaigning for the highest possible level because they were mostly representing northern recipients, which had high payment levels, and so they wanted you know, more and relief for those northern states. And I said, besides, nobody except Moynihan wanted it, and I said, no. <laughs> and then, if you read my book, I I've, I've trace the publications in Human Events and National Review, the conservatives and even the hard right opposition to this. 
They called it redistributionist, and they were after Nixon's scalp for two and a half years uh, on it. And Reagan uh, himself mounted a, a campaign against it. And that's a whole different story. But so the, the liberals didn't get on board, and the conservatives then, uh, in abject horror, started to rebel against it. But Nixon fought for it for over two years, over two years. And then brought Moynihan back in 73 and 4 when they tr started to try again. Anyway, uh, and, and I, you know, I have to tell you a very personal feeling, which uh, I do relate in the book. And I, w I went to a college called Grinnell, which had a great history in the social gospel movement and uh, about a century ago and a century and a quarter. And it was a, a, a sense that there is a, a duty on society to, you know, basically based on Judeo-Christian uh, feelings, but that society had an obligation to do something for those who were, who were uh, in sore need. And so uh, one Saturday morning in the spring of 69, I was sitting in my office and I get a call from Haldeman, who was the chief of staff, and he said, you remember that decision paper you wrote that went to the president at Key Biscayne for Easter weekend. I said, yes. He said, bring a copy now. And I, I looked and I said, well, there's only the file copy. I have, you know, it's carbon copy days, if you remember those. So we had only the file copy. I couldn't just put it on the word processor and press print. And so he said, bring it now. And I walked out with it and I walked down to the lawn, South Lawn, and the helicopter was waiting. Nixon was at the foot of the stairs. Haldeman was standing, waiting. And I take it and I hand it to Haldeman. Haldeman hands it to Nixon. He puts it under his arm and walks up the stairs. And Haldeman says he wanted to take it to Camp David to read again this weekend. And so it expanded the, the assistance, this cash assistance, to 13 million more Americans. <coughs> and it just hit me. Other here. In my lifetime, I have thought and taught that Democrats are liberals, Republicans are conservatives. But in an era when you have conservative Republican or conservative Democrats and liberal Republicans, what differentiated Republican and Democrat with foreign policy, economics, political some machine? Of, some of all this, all <laughs> the above, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, I remember, you know, coming of age when Republicans thought all big, all big cities were run by machine Democrats, you know, patronage and corruption. And I'm not saying I believe that, but that was in the, in the ether. And that uh, Republicans were basically, you know, uh, m probably a bit more rural, a bit more small business. Um, and probably a bit more uh, higher educational levels. There was a sort of uh, mix of that. But uh, it, it was, it, that was the thing about the 50s. It was a situation where there were these very formidable factions within both parties, which were more moderate or more conservative. And um, I mean, John Doerr's comment to me it was very illustrative of a mindset of the time. Big labor, Democrats, you know. Big city, corrupt bosses, Democrats. Southern Democrats, Democrats, you know. And, and segregationists. And uh, Roosevelt had managed this Faustian bargain, you know, throughout the whole New Deal. Um, but I'm not answering your question directly because I, I think that I, I read about a meeting that Wendell Wilkie had with Franklin Roosevelt after Wilkie's defeat. And when Wilkie actually went on a foreign mission to, for Roosevelt after he'd been beaten for the presidency. And in it, uh, Roosevelt said, and Wilkie was concurring, that, well, we need a realignment of parties. We need to have an all-liberal party and an all-conservative party. Well, I don't know where we are on that spectrum. <laughs> Your guess is as good as mine, but but there was a day. I mean, I was active, as I say. This is a memoir of my ten years in 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 an active life in American politics. When I was in that uh, battle, uh, 
the Republicans had both moderates and conservatives. And of course, they had hard right. You know, you had McCarthyites and so on as well. But um, that that's pretty well changed. I mean, you, you've uh, seen a, a quite a modification of the parties. Other questions up here on the front? This has been interesting to learn uh, things about Nixon that I didn't have any glimmer were true. Uh, I wonder if you would also, though, tell us he wasn't able to to make those ideas become reality, but he, mostly, mostly. So you might tell us to the extent he could. But I'm also interested in knowing, as we remember Nixon, what did he leave behind, particularly in terms of international. Uh, relations. I was with you up to the last subordinate clause <laughs> because I'm, I'm not a, a national security expert, but, um, but let me say as to what he left behind, there's a lady here tonight who is, has been an administrator within the state government of one of the programs that Nixon did get passed. It was a negative income tax for what used to be called the adult categories and it was part of his family assistance plan proposal. And it, it put a floor under the, the incomes of all those Americans who were either partially and totally disabled or who were blind or who were the elderly poor. Combined it into a program called SSI, Supplemental Security Income, which you helped to administer. And so that is one thing that did happen for very needy people. Another thing is the food stamp program. I mean, we, we tend to say, well, sure, food stamps have been here all along. And they were patchy, you know, just a, a crazy quilt until, until uh, 69 and 70. And Nixon, in May of 69, um, proposed taking the food stamp program, making it rational. It was not in every county. Commodity distribution was not even in every county. But so Nixon and then George McGovern and Bob Dole and Jake Javits and George Murphy, a conservative Republican from California, they put it together and built the, the current food stamp program, now the SNAP, Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, which basically was, as I say, an income-tested uh, negative income tax. So that is there. It persists despite budgetary concerns. Nonetheless, it is feeding feeding needy people. And then uh, as far as the health area goes, the health insurance, as I say, Nixon's structure in so many ways was the foundation for Obamacare. You know, people don't like to, to hear that. There's another thing. It's in the air currently. Rick Scott of Florida is saying all poor people must have skin in the game. They have to pay taxes. Well, Nixon, in April of 1969, three months into office, looked at the tax code and he said, wait a minute. He said, we have a federal definition of a poverty line, don't we? Yes. And he said, we have an income tax scale bracket. <coughs> yes. Why is it that people who are below the defined poverty line by the United States government are paying federal income tax? And they got it abolished. Now, last week, there's a proposal that no, no, they have to have skin in the game, so we need to start taxing again people who are below the poverty line. So Nixon, uh, whether you agree with it or don't, I'm just saying that is something which he left behind uh, as a, now in the foreign policy area, I am married to a Russian. I have a nephew in Moscow who was out demonstrating today for Ukraine. We do not know if he's safe or not. Uh, I can only say that uh, I, um, I have lots of Russian friends, I have lots of Ukrainian friends, and I would like to think that somehow the way Nixon played his cards in the strategic arms limitation talks by w playing China off against uh, Russia to, to lead to treaties which lasted until just now, very, very recently, that he might have been more adept at, at managing uh, this. Uh, he did, and it was almost the Quaker thing again. Um, <laughs> Pat Buchanan writes in one of his books, he said, you know, Nixon w in his inaugural address talked in effect about beating 
swords into plowshares and and bringing peace, he said, you know, the amazing thing about Richard Nixon is he really believed that. And I'm no apologist for the dark side, I, I'm not. But I, my argument is that I see, and he, and he said it was the Quaker thing in him, uh, the, the pl you know, swords into plowshares. But I see a similar Quaker thing at work in the domestic side. There was some sort of impulse there. And uh, at the same time, he was a student of foreign policy, he relished it. When he was out of office, I, I went to see him in, on uh, Elba, <laughs> out in San Clemente, and um, I said, well, you know, you've always been more interested in foreign policy. He said, oh, and John, no, 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 no. <laughs> domestic policy was very important. <laughs> but the, the point is that, yes, of course, he always loved that. And starting with Thomas Jefferson, I've just been reading Henry Adams' History of the United States, now on the first Jefferson administration. I was reading it the other night. And he says, Jefferson felt that president and central government had no business in domestic affairs. No reason to pay any attention to domestic affairs. Leave it to the states, the job of the president and the treasury and the state department and the army, forget the navy, he, he didn't care for the navy, is to worry about foreign policy. Uh, but Nixon, Nixon was passionately interested in it. And don't forget, he was around a long time and he was vice president for two terms under a man who had contact with everybody in the known world, you know, in Russia even. Eisenhower kept off with General Zhukov until Stalin cut him off. You know, they exchanged Christmas, pres Christmas presents. And so Nixon was the beneficiary of, of these relationships, and he absorbed it, and he drank it in. And so he, he had not just a skill and a tactical brilliance and a, uh, a poker player's acumen. He won a lot of money in the Navy during the war playing poker. He did. Uh, but but he also had a sense of uh, America's role in the world and, and w always with that, I think, with that uh, instinct for finding a way toward peace, even if it had to be through peace through strength. You've heard that phrase. So I'm, now you've got me just on uh, tracks down which I shouldn't go because <laughs> I'm not that, not that experienced <laughs> with it. <laughs> Thank you. Let's see, I think we have time for one more. So Nixon signed the National Environmental Policy Act in 1969. What involvement did he have in environmental None. policy? None, except knowing Bill Russell's house. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah, I, I spent time with him in Seattle about a year before his death recently and just uh, had always admired him. But, but uh, uh, no, but that was something for which Nixon will probably remember. He, Nixon lamented, he said, I'll only be remembered for Watergate and China and maybe EPA. You know, he didn't say that, but, but your question shows that point to be true. And, uh, I, I, let me close by saying that, that uh, I mentioned I'm not an apologist for that dark side, but it was there and I never saw it, but others clearly did. And Len Garment, who was Richard Nixon's law partner, and whom I worked for during the general election in 1968, remained a very good <coughs> friend. And I remember one time after the 70, 1970 midterm elections when things had gotten really sour and Nixon, uh, as I mentioned in the book, I say he curdled, you know, in a rally at San Jose, he just jeered at the, the protesters and, and he just, you know, he got venomous and just finally he just broke out all the frustration. And Garment said to me, and I've got it in my diary, which, which is uh, extensive over the years. Garment said to me, John, he said, y you and Ehrlichman work for a very complicated, difficult man. And he said, it's the changes, the mood changes. He said, he, Nixon, moves from rage to generosity, from eloquence to something other. It's just who he is. So anyway, enough said. Thank you all for, Thank you, John. for being here. <laughs> really appreciate it so much. Thank you. Okay. Don't miss your opportunity to pick up the book uh, in the Darby Gallery on the way out. John will sign it for you if Thank you're you. here. And uh, I think we're anticipating somewhat of a snowstorm in the next oh. couple of days. So you'll want to 
grab this so you can hunker down. <laughs> Bedside reading. You can, it's like hanging out with John, reading this book. Fascinating. John, John thanks Thank again you. for being Thank with us. And I hope you'll come back um, tomorrow uh, afternoon here at the Dole Institute. We'll have our next installment of our discussion group, as Barbara mentioned, with our fellow Bob Blameyer and chief of staff uh, for Senator Dole, Sheila Burke. That will be a fascinating discussion. So great. have a great evening, everyone. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Okay.